In the gaming world, if anyone mentions the name Hideo Kojima, Metal Gear Solid is bound to come up in the conversation. Currently, the latest installment of Metal Gear Solid, Snake Eater, is in the works. It will extend the legacy of the game's designer, developer, and producer. Born in Tokyo and raised near Kobe, Mr. Kojima is an interesting blend of renaissance man and high-tech guru. The PlayStation Underground traveled to Tokyo to get a more detailed portrait of the man who would be Solid Snake. I never thought of working in the video game industry. Actually, as a child, I wanted to become an astronaut, or I wanted to become a naturalist, and I always enjoyed watching film. But the Japanese film industry is very closed, it's feudalistic. Right around then, I ran into the home computer, and I started playing video games, and that's when I started thinking about working in the video game industry. Kojima-san landed a job at Konami Entertainment, working in the home computer department. There, he created the first Metal Gear in 1987. Snatcher and Police Knots followed a few years later. With the release of Metal Gear Solid for the PlayStation in 1998, the gaming world could not help but notice the birth of a star. And back before Metal Gear Solid, my games were for the Japanese market only, so I never thought about the rest of the world. But once Metal Gear Solid came out, I had to start thinking about fans all over the world, so that's a big change. Part of that change is raising the bar of expectations and imagination when creating a great game. I have to make sure that the people out there enjoy what I create. There are all kinds of people all over the world that will be playing my game. Figuring out what people would possibly enjoy is what's very challenging, but at the same time very fun about creating video games. Making people feel that something is beautiful or something is very scary, that's the easy part. What's difficult is making people feel that what they're playing is fun. Video games are probably the only medium that allows people to do that. During the planning stage, since everything is in your head, you can really do anything. And it's all up to me, up to my imagination. So I can come up with anything, and it's so fun. When I give all my ideas to my people and they start putting things together, when I actually see the game coming together, it really is a gratifying moment. This innovator has a consistent style that holds to form. His technique has been influenced by film directors like Akira Kurosawa and especially Alfred Hitchcock switching between first-person POV and objective bird's-eye view to create tension and suspense. Hideo Kojima has become known for blending the cinematic technique with the latest gaming technology to create new levels of shared personal gaming experiences. Back when I started in the industry, people said games and film were like water and oil, that they'd never mix. But that's changed. We now have a common language. Video games, film, music, everything has become so digital. And I think there will be a lot of blending going on. You'll see totally new discoveries sprouting out from the fusion of these things. Eventually, maybe even the word game might be gone. I don't think video games have reached that status yet. Film, movies and novels, the good ones, in addition to entertaining people, they have positive effects. And I don't think video games have that effect yet. So hopefully in the future, there will be video games out there that have this positive effect on people's lives, just like movies and novels. You can be sure when that happens, Hideo Kojima will be at the front of the line having a positive effect on people. He shares his secret for worldwide success. Video games are things that people play with, people use. So what I'd recommend is first you interact with different people out there. And then you should read a lot of novels, see a lot of movies. And try to establish as many virtual personalities within you as possible. Try to be these other people out there. So my piece of advice is to know people. If you want to know more about the upcoming release of Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater, check back here, Inside the Game. And don't forget to check out the latest Metal Gear Solid 3 trailer included in this issue. In the forward-thinking world of video games, it's time to do something unusual. That is, look back. 
Available now for the PlayStation 2 is a nostalgia series for anyone who is out of diapers by 1980. Midway Arcade Treasures, a compilation of 20 of the best arcade games. Producing and working with these games really brought back some memories from when I was in high school. You know, I would walk home, stop at the pizza parlor, you know, I'd grab a soda, grab some change, and spend, you know, half hour, an hour playing these games. Sound familiar? Defender, Joust, and Gauntlet are just a few of the classic quarter crunchers that you can relive with this game. For some people, it probably would be difficult to fight the urge to update these games, um, but we felt that we just wanted to keep it classic. We wanted to keep it to what people would remember. And few remember better than these guys. Now elder statesmen of the biz, George Gomez and Mark Trammell designed some of the most pioneering arcade games back in the day. George remembers what it was like working on Spy Hunter, which is included on Midway Arcade Treasures. We were this little development team that nobody paid attention to, sort of in a, in a warehouse in the company. Like, it was just a bunch of guys with a passion for games that had talked the company into letting us try to work on games. Let's go! Mark was the man behind Smash TV, also included on Midway Arcade Treasures. I knew Smash TV was going to be a classic game uh, probably two weeks after I started the game. Most features of the industry have changed, but the raw thrill of launching a new game existed then as it does now. You know, put some great graphics up front, uh, do really nice big explosion sound effects, and you know, hook the player um, early. When you'd walk in, you would hear, big money, big prizes, bingo! So it was uh, definitely an attention grabber. An attention grabber that sucked you in one quarter at a time. My path was always going into the arcade and seeing kids, you know, pumping money into the machine, enjoying it, looking around, laughing, smiling. Designing for the arcade was different than it is for home play. The arcades were inherently social. When a cool game was in an arcade, it had a crowd around it. The thing that's changed the least over the last 20 years in game development uh, is just the kind of the, the core um, requirement that you entice people along. And that's just what these classic games figured out how to do, with simple ideas and simple controls. It's very clear to the user uh, what his mission is. Uh, a couple of buttons, one joystick, a few bad guys on the screen, it's very clear. Even though the medium is different, um, the medium has evolved, I think that the, there's still entertainment value in the old stuff. And they managed to create that enticement and entertainment with paltry technical horsepower. Our tools were really primitive. Our art tools were, um, I mean, they were one step beyond coloring in grid paper. I had a roll of paper and I drew the road on this and I just kept on rolling the paper and drawing the road. The hardware designer for Spy Hunter told me that I had uh, 4,096 colors to select from. Uh, but I could only use 32 at a time. <laughs> <laughs> Laughable by today's standards, but somehow these games still suck you in. It's kind of like watching a great old movie. It's, uh, you know, you've seen it before, you've seen it a hundred times. Maybe it doesn't have the spectacular special effects that a current version would have, but it still works great. I mean, it still tells a story. And remember, there was little precedent for these games. Each one, like Smash TV, was creating its own new genre. When we put that game into the arcades, uh, it was expected that, that there would be bedlam. People would, you know, would pump money into it, and indeed that's what happened. And 15 years later, Mark is still blowing away players with innovation. He's creative director at Midway Sports. Sometimes he marvels at how far games have come. Back in 88, 89, that's really when we first uh, began to digitize images. Digitizing textures for walls, faces. And so that was really kind of um, groundbreaking at the time. We've gone from three or four man teams to 50 man teams. Uh, at bigger companies, 100 man teams, 150 man teams. I have no idea what it used to cost us to fund a four man team back then, but I'm sure it wasn't $12 million. And those big bucks and big teams are making games better and better. Well, I think the future of video games is incredibly bright. Um, it's a very exciting time now because the technology again is about to quadruple over the previous generation. I think the future video games is going to be games that basically allow you to have this interactive experience with a movie, which is what we've been trying to do since day one.
Well, I'd say about a month into development, we came up with a one sentence description that really has guided the development of the product. And the one sentence was, Sly and the gang work together to pull off a string of big heists. When I say heist, I mean like classic Hollywood heist film kind of heist, where the last third of the film was all about this big, spectacular, elaborate crime involving many thieves working together to do something huge. Sly is the charismatic leader of the band of thieves. He's got that moxie, he's got that skill under pressure that makes him special. He's getting a little bit more daring with what kinds of crimes he's doing. And this time, we're, we're actually introducing the pals that he ran with in the last game, uh, bringing them into the forefront. Bentley's like the brains, Murray's the brawn, and Sly is kind of like the soul. We're setting up heists and jobs for the crew to do together. An example of that is the recon mission, where you must go in and uh, take pictures that you can take back to headquarters, and Bentley, the turtle being the brain of the operation, will take these pictures and formulate a master plan. Once the master plan comes together, each character has a role in executing that plan. We wanted to maintain really strong visuals, really strong, you know, emotionally involving characters and continue to deliver the great feel of the character that I think we did really well in the last game. We really want you, when you're playing the game, to feel like you're part of the world, living an adventure, um, finding your own way through the world and the things that there are to do in that world. We don't want people to play Sly, we want people to be Sly. We want people to feel like they are not playing through levels as much as experiencing different episodes in the universe of Sly Cooper and his gang. and silence through the night What a thrill I'm searching and I'll melt into you What a fear in my heart But you're so supreme
tree frog. It's so deep the trial to survive. For the day we see new.
I love sports, but you gotta know what games are right for you. Same with computer and video games. That's why parents have to make sure each game is right for their kids. How? Check the rating. Every computer and video game has a rating symbol that tells you what age group the game is best for. There's also a content label that tells you what's in the game. When you check the rating, the control's in your hands. See? You gotta play the game that's right for you. Excitement is in the air. People lined up around the block at Sony's Metreon Theater in San Francisco just to get a glimpse of Jet Li, world-renowned action star, and star of the brand new video game Rise to Honor. I made a lot of films already, this first video game, and I'm very excited to work on it with uh, PlayStation 2. Usually you're watching a movie, the audience just watching, but this time the audience become director. They can control Jet Li. I'm still the actor. <laughs> I do my job. So they can control Jet Li fighting with the bad guy. The Metreon was the perfect location to unveil Rise to Honor because the San Francisco landmark happens to be the setting of one of the game's most exciting levels. Hi, everybody. I'm Jim Wallace. I'm the producer of Rise to Honor. And we're here at the Metreon in San Francisco. We actually use this location for parts of the video game. And you can tell by how cool this place is why we wanted to do that. In fact, there's a scene where the Jet Li character, Kit Yoon, and the female lead, Michelle, come running down this escalator, and they have their boss encounter right back here. I am Tung Lung. I'll be Jet Li. <laughs> so right in this area here, Jet comes in, a bunch of baddies surround them, and the action starts. <laughs> One of the cool things about this area is that it's the first place in the game where you can do collaborative fighting. So all the player has to do is basically do a grab move on Michelle, just like you would on any other enemy, and then you're able to do these like long distance collaborative attacks. All right, I need a female volunteer. So now I just take her, we swing her out, and she's kicking exactly just like that. Something like that, you get the idea. Michelle! This is one of the really unique looking areas of the Metreon, and we love that view out that way. You can see the MoMA in the background, and it's really cool visually. And as he's coming down this catwalk, bad guys start coming across these beams and jumping over, and he's encountered with a fight right here in the middle. Also, one of the things graphically that we're doing in the game is that you can see the reflection of the fighting characters against this window. Came across really cool. So the best technique for getting through this area, grab hold of enemies, Chuck them over the railing, and you'll have no problem getting through. Outside, the anticipation was really building as some fans had been waiting hours to get a glimpse of the Rise to Honor star. We come all the way from Oakland to get involved with Jet Li and get his, get his autograph and all of this. Yeah, I want his autograph, man. Standing here for like two and a half hours. I will do flips to meet Jet Li, I swear I will. And I'll, I'll watch him do flips yes. to meet Jet Li. You just like a high, anything high action. If you love Jet Li, if you love his movies, this game with the lick right here, I love it. Fighting style in the game looks tight, so yeah, I think it's gonna be a good game. Probably the best fighting game I've played in a while. Since Rise to Honor is styled after classic Hong Kong action films, it was only fitting that the crowd got a chance to see and play the game in the IMAX theater. Welcome to Sony's official launch of Rise to Honor. So our fight system is based on the ability to attack people coming at you from any direction, okay? To be able to launch pinpoint attacks anywhere in 360 degrees space. I hope you guys enjoy... Oh. Hey, everybody! I'm always the actor, but this time, you're the director. As the crowd enjoyed the game on the 80-foot screen, we got a chance to sit down with Jet and find out why he wanted to make video games. I already dreaming about one day I'm become very old man, like a 60, 70 year old man. I cannot fight on the screen anymore. Okay. But the technology okay. maybe can help me motion capture yeah. my movement okay. while I'm still young. Yeah. <laughs> so in that way, maybe one day 
you can still use the motion capture to make another video game or maybe movie. We never know in the future the technology maybe really can help the old man become young man fighting on the screen or videos. I think this is my dream. For those who weren't lucky enough to make it in for the IMAX screening, there were plenty of other opportunities to preview the game. <laughs> And for those fans who waited for hours to meet their favorite superstar, they were not disappointed as Jet took the time to sign a few autographs and talk with his fans about the game. The basic idea is jelly movement. We need to know, we need some signature move. By the player, when they play the game, they know right away that's the jelly. <laughs> After that, we need to do different levels to create a different kind of movement. For both sides, we learn each other. You know, we know how to make movies, but we didn't know how to make a game. But they know how to make a game, but they don't know martial arts. So, like a whole team, teamwork. <laughs> So check out Rise to Honor, available now for the PlayStation 2. This is my destiny. Driver coming on the scene back in 1999 really represented the birth of the vehicular action genre. And uh, now here in 2004 with the release of Driver 3, we're just really excited about bringing um, the Driver brand to a whole new level. We wanted to kind of capture this, uh, this filmic kind of realism. Driver 3 kind of perfects the idea of a kind of a Hollywood car chase. A couple of months back, a producer that we used named Simon Miller came to us with the idea of utilizing um, RSA as a company to do our spots for Driver 3. We've uh, recently produced uh, some work with uh, Ridley Scott Associates, uh, in particular with director Sean Mullins. Had a terrific experience, and actually on that shoot, I learned that he was a bit of a driver junkie himself. Same thing, we're just gonna go this way with these guys. The director, Sean Mullins, uh, actually pitched us on a short film uh, um, that we just uh, sunk our teeth into right away. We thought it was just the greatest thing in the world. We decided to make a film about Tanner and about Tanner delivering a car back to Kalita. My name is... In the course of that uh, delivery, in the course of that gauntlet, he goes through uh, being shot at by thousands of rounds of ammunition. Uh, does incredible high speed precision driving. 100 mile an hour down alleyways. And he's chased by a couple of um, uh, bad guy cars that aren't so lucky in the pursuit. All of it leads up to him bringing the car back to Kalita. Today's our big day for wrecking everything. That we're asked to create something in the air of having the car tumble through. In preparation for a stunt like that, I mean, it's a combination of, uh, you know, everybody here. You know, you rely on a, a lot of your teammates. We got all the way spun. 
It's, it's an adrenaline rush. So far we've probably destroyed, oh, maybe 12 cars, something like that. Um, and uh, we're kind of on the last shot of the second day. Okay, uh, what we have out in the way of product is, uh, looks like four gallons of gasoline. Nobody does anything until they hear me say cut. All right, the bomb is hot. Here we go. This is my destiny. That's what Driver is really all about. It's the celebration of, you know, Hollywood action production values. It's very, very Atari. It's very, very cutting edge for um, the industry that we're in. Um, I don't think anyone's tried to execute something on this level. This project for Driver 3 is by far the largest thing that, uh, that uh, we've ever been a part of. It's the drive to excel while outperforming rivals, the will to be the best. Winning. It's understanding that the extra effort, the scrutiny of detail, and the teamwork that blends individual talents are what separate the good from the truly great. When it comes to delivering the heart-quickening thrills and demonstrating the quick reflexes and decision-making needed to be a great race car driver, the undisputed leader of the pack is the Gran Turismo franchise. And while they have set the bar in terms of sales, it's the authentic aspects of the gameplay physics, the realistic models of the cars, and the spot-on design of the courses that keep the Gran Turismo racing game out in front. It takes an unbelievable amount of time and effort to produce a game as data intensive as the new Gran Turismo 4. The PlayStation Underground joined the innovative game makers at Polyphony Digital on several of their data gathering expeditions to see what it takes to be the best. The person in charge of maintaining and even extending their lead is Kazunori Yamauchi, president of Polyphony Digital. An avid follower of Formula One and many other types of racing, Mr. Yamauchi began his quest to create a truly realistic driving video game in 1992. He produced Motor Tune Grand Prix and then altered the course of the racing genre with the Gran Turismo series. Kazunori explains the process of designing and developing the world's finest auto racing game. The photo shoot and the data collection are an important part of the creation process. The reason we collect data is not because without it we couldn't make the game, rather it's more to confirm the accuracy of the car we made in the studio, so we don't apply the real data directly to the game. For the photo shoot of the cars, we take a large selection of pictures, shots from four basic angles, diagonal shots, and others. We also do sound recordings of the actual cars. While Mr. Yamauchi oversees the entire process, there are specialists assigned to specific tasks. This is the area for taking photographs of the cars. My job is to shoot the beauty shots from many angles. I also manage the other photographers who also take photos. Additionally, when the 3D models of the cars are constructed, these photos are used as references and are also used to provide textures. In the new Gran Turismo 4, there will be over 500 different cars to choose from. And if you think that's a lot of data to gather, think about what it takes to map the over 50 courses the new game will feature. Using all types of technology, the team will measure virtually every nook and cranny of every turn, building, and bump down to the millimeter. All of these precise measurements go hand in hand with how the car drives. The physics engine of Gran Turismo 4 has been totally redesigned to create one of the most realistic driving experiences ever offered in a gaming console. In addition, we choose several of the cars and gather data. We measure the car's maximum speeds, record gravity forces, and assess their cornering abilities. 
Actual race car drivers are enlisted yeah. to provide information on driving, especially the more elusive feel of a course. I'd like to think that I can bring some extra insight to the game, um, where the, the feel of real driving translates. You know, I just love playing, and hopefully I can give good input to the guys that developed the game, then that'll, that'll make sense to the, the actual person playing it in the end. I'm going to evaluate the product from a race car driver's perspective. There's so much depth in real-life racing. There's communication between the cars, communication between the driver and the car, and all that. So you really need someone who's experienced that in real life to translate it to the game. Gran Turismo is awesome. I mean, a lot of drivers use it to learn tracks before they go. Everything from you know, what gear they should be in in a certain turn or what exit speed they can expect when they get there. It just gives me you know, a better feel of what it's like to drive a road race car. Gran Turismo is so successful at creating the most authentic racing experience that people from every sector of the automotive industry want to be involved in the franchise. The automakers are realizing the importance of the, the marketing, the branding that they get within the games. Young enthusiasts are getting an opportunity today to actually drive some of the cars that the American public really came to know more through the Gran Turismo series than from seeing rally races in person or even viewing them on TV. While Polyphony Digital's president enjoys all the attention paid to his game, he always strives to focus on the original reason for creating Gran Turismo. First of all, I'm happy that we were able to work closely with car manufacturers and with pro race car drivers. At the same time, there's an increased risk that I'll forget the feeling I had when I originally created Gran Turismo, namely the sense of just another car owner with the enthusiastic emotions that users feel toward their cars. It's important never to forget the feeling from the user's perspective. Gran Turismo is a gift to all the people who love cars around the world. Even now, that hasn't changed. Check back here at Track GT Ford and find out about some of the new features and improvements that will be included in the latest and greatest version of Gran Turismo.